Well, it is Christmas time, and as we know, Christmas time around the world is a time where it is mostly spent, where we buy gifts, exchange gifts, and unwrap gifts. And since this is the case, I believe the right sermon to be preached this morning in this occasion must be on the grace of God. Grace. Because grace is the greatest gift given to the worst kind of sinners at Jesus' expense. If you have come through these doors this morning, are you sad and you're broken? And if you're Life is falling apart. If you're craving and your thirst for the pleasures of this world let you down, all the way down into the dumps, and if you feel miserable because of even your own sins, it really doesn't matter what kind of sin you're addicted to. The grace of God offers you to walk out of here a new man. It really doesn't matter how long you have been sunk into this wickedness that led you to feel so guilty and so ashamed that that guilt and shame happen to be your best friends. If you give your heart to what God has to say to you this morning, you will walk out of here and you man and your heart will burst with joy and you will come out singing the grace of God. Because that is exactly what the grace of God does when it rests on the heart of man. And there are no many passages in the Scripture that will come so close to be so rich and so full of God's grace than Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2. Would you please turn to Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2. And once again, just to background to understand these passages in context, it's 740 B.C., before the first Christmas ever took place. God saw the wickedness of Israel rising all the way up to the cloud. And it was appalling. In a chapter 1 of Isaiah, God says, Alice, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evil doers, sons who, are, who act corruptly. Again, it says that the whole head is sick. And the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds. They were basically utterly corrupt. Now, no, they were not serial killers. They were not drug dealers. In fact, they were just like all of us this morning. They prayed, they went to the temple, they were decent people. They combed their hair, they ironed their shirts, there was no grease in their clothes. They cut their fingernails, they were good people. But what was their problem? Well, God, who looks beyond the outer appearance, the God who x-rays the souls of man. He read their hearts like an open book. And his diagnosis was the following. In chapter 1, verse 1, they have revolted against God. Verse 2, sorry, verse 3, they didn't know God. Verse 4, they have abandoned God. And verse 5 of chapter 1, they continue to rebel against God. So simply put, they didn't want God to be in control. They wanted to be in control over their own lives. 
They rejected their creator, the one who gave them breath and life. They rejected him to be the Lord over their own lives. When they would wake up in the morning and they look at a mirror, they wanted the person whom they see in that mirror to be the one who's in charge of their lives. Yes, they fasted. Yes, they prayed. And they thought of themselves to be religious people. But their lives were lived out for themselves. Where they lived, where they worked, how they holidayed, and what kind of people they called friends and wanted to hang out with, the clothes they wore, the things that they watched, even their own bank transactions at that time, everything they did was about themselves and God was almost virtually out of the picture. They were the captains of their ships and the masters of their souls and God was just simply an accessory. So the judge of the world, slammed down the gavel, declared them guilty, and their rebellion has kindled the anger of a holy God. And the consequences for living this way meant that God punished them. And so those Israelites were sent into exile all the way from Israel to Babylon. Babylon is Iraq. Their nostrils were hooked, their hands were chained, and they were dragged into exile, to Babylon. And for 72 years, they drank the cup of their suffering, and they felt the heat of their affliction, how they were enslaved to harsh masters who stripped them off of their peace and their comfort. And 72 years later, long after the first generation, for the most part, died, and their descendants were convinced in their heart that they were reaping the wrath of a holy God because of their rebellion, and they were crushed under the weight of their own sins, and their guilt and their shame brought them to their knees. And this text was written to them. Now, you may have not been dragged all the way to Babylon, but can you identify with the brokenness of these people because of your sins? Have your affliction dried up the tongue of your heart and your yearning for drops of mercy to fall from heaven? If yes, and do I have good news for you? Because it was those to those people and to everyone in this room that can relate to these people's afflictions, their guilt and their shame. It is to those people, to you, if that is you, this text is written. And you will find your name sprinkled all over this passage this morning. So let's read it together. Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. So what do we have here? We have here an earthly picture that has a heavenly meaning. And this picture is a picture of a salesman who's standing at a street corner in a marketplace and he's selling some merchandise. 
in that picture, as we gaze upon it, this gracious picture, it arrests our attention. It captivates our souls. But if we look deep enough into it, we will discover that it's not just a picture. It's a door. It's a gateway to God's grace in Jesus Christ. And this passage is inviting us to go through this gate so that we would not only find drops of God's mercy, but enough mercy and compassion to flood our hearts. The outline for today's sermon, what we want to look at is the seller, the buyers, and the product that is being sold. First, the seller. Who is the salesman in this, in this picture here? It is God. God has graciously reduced himself to be a salesman in that marketplace standing at a street corner and he's calling upon the people that are passing by to come. And he's calling upon them with a loud voice and we read in that verse, verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts. So God, who's a salesman, saying, Ho, everyone. Hey, you. Look over here. Listen, I've got a bargain for you worth grabbing. Then if you pay attention, he uses the word come three times. He says, come to the waters. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. He's not whispering it. He is shouting it. He is screaming his lungs out and he says, Come. And he ends it with saying, without money and without cost, he's giving it away for free. Does that mean? Come, come, come. Without money, come. He's not backing off. He won't settle until he gives away all that he's selling. He doesn't want to have anything that is left over in this mega sale. That is the best sale you'll ever come across. God in his compassion for broken sinners, he's willing to reduce himself to that of a salesman and he's gone all out and he's pleading with you to come to him. In fact, this command to come to him is so important to the heart of God that God sealed his word and closed up the canon by echoing exactly the same invitation as the last imperative command in the entire Bible. In Revelation, the last chapter of the last book, our gracious good God has given his last written command. Verse 17 of Revelation 22 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Furthermore, please note, this salesman is standing at the street corner and he is competing against other dodgy salesmen who are selling junk food that tastes like cardboard and yet they're charging premium price on it. And we see that in verse 2. It says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? And what God is saying here is that why do you throw away your hard-earned labor in buying gravel as, as burger? This is not rice. This is sand. It will not satisfy you. Then he continues on and he says, Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself 
in abundance. Oh, I'm selling organic stuff here, delicious stuff. I only sell best product and I got truckloads of them. Delight yourself in abundance. This is our gracious God. Can you tell that sense of urgency in the heart of God as He's yearning for people and urging you to come to Him and to receive what He's selling freely? You know, some people know, and rightly so, that God, our God, is a sovereign Lord. But they have this false idea about God and they reduce him to the level of Allah, you know, the God of Islam, who's a cruel monster, heartless towards sinners. Well, not so with our God. Yes, he is sovereign. Yes, his supremacy is unchallenged. But this text bears witness that our God He's a kind-hearted God. He's a tender-hearted God, gracious God. Will we hear that command and obey Him and come to Him? So the first point, the seller. Who is the seller? Our infinitely good God. Now we come to the second one, the buyers. Who are these buyers that God is offering His product to? It says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Everyone. If you're a boy or a girl, you're sitting at the front row or sitting all the way at the back row. If you're a man or a woman, if you're rich or poor, if you have an intelligent brain, that of Einstein or a brain of a monkey, the grace of God has got long arms and a loud voice, and it calls for all of us to come, everyone. But now pay even closer attention to what it says. There is a condition, and God now is about to filter out because it is not to everyone as we think this invitation is given. It says, who, what? Thirsts. It's so not to everyone, it is to those that thirst, everyone who thirsts. Now, what is that thirst? What do you thirst for so that you'll be a legitimate buyer? Thirst for a better life? A better, more meaning and purpose in your life? No, everybody wants to have a better life. Everybody wants to have a meaning and purpose to his life. That is not what it means. That is not the context of this. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Everyone who thirsts means that there has to be a recognition of wickedness in the heart such that that a person is craving for the righteousness of God. How do we know that? Because in the same passage in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7, it says, it tells us that, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There has to be a recognition of one's wickedness. That is what a thirst is. And how thirsty do you have to be? It tells us here, you who have no money. It's a thirst of a beggar. A longing of a beggar to live. You must sense there is a drought in your heart for God's righteousness. If your spiritual wallet is empty, if you have filed a spiritual bankruptcy and declared that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, 
It is you this invitation is given to come. You who have no money, meaning that you stand before God with empty hands, naked as you are, without any goodness of your own to offer to Him. If you think that you can impress God with your good works, or that somehow God owes you a place in heaven because there is something in you that is worth it, if you think that there is a halo in your head and that you're good enough to be accepted by God, what God is offering here is not for you. This offer is only for spiritual beggars. If you have no reliance in yourself, no self-confidence whatsoever that you can save yourself by yourself, You are qualified to come. If you would say to God, apart from you, I can do nothing. My lips are cracked, my soul is dry, and I'm craving for your goodness to quench the thirst of my own wickedness. God, I am lost without a Savior. I am helpless and hopeless without a Savior. It is to you that God calls you to come. So who is this offer made to? It is made to all kinds of people, but it reaches all the way to the worst of sinners that are desperate to be forgiven. Rahab the prostitute. Moses the prophet was a murderer. Paul the apostle was a terrorist. And they all came And they came to God as thirsty beggars, and God never cast any of them out. Such is the grace of God. How gracious is that grace of God? This is why we call it amazing grace. God says to you, you who have no money, come. So who is the seller? The infinitely good God. And he gives away his merchandise to whom? Who are the buyers? The worst of sinners that are desperate for forgiveness. Are you desperate? If you are, then this is what God has to offer to you. Number three, the product. What is a product? That he's giving here away. Well, notice here it says, Come to the waters, buy milk and, ma- and wine. So you have waters, you have milk, and you have wine. What are these things? These are none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In the New Testament, Jesus personalized them all. For example, he said in Matthew 11, verse 28, as we heard today in the morning. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the product. This is the merchandise that God is giving away. The best Christmas present ever is not wrapped in a paper. No, it is wrapped in human flesh. And it is not placed neatly under a Christmas tree. No, it is nailed naked. To a cross, to come to the waters and buy milk and wine is indeed to come to Jesus Christ. So we'll take him one at a time, right? We'll start with waters. Waters. What does that speak of? John 7, 37, it says that Jesus stood out, stood and cried out, Saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Water speaks of life. It quenches the thirst. It revives the soul. If you're stuck in a hot, dry land for, I don't know, two days, three days, and you're gasping for life, what do you need? You need water. And if you're gasping for eternal life, you've got to come to Christ. 
And so if you say in your heart, I thirst for peace with God. And when I hear about those Israelites that rebelled against God, it is as though I'm looking at a mirror and I'm hating what I'm seeing. Every day I get up and I want to be in charge of my life. And in my arrogance, I've been delusioned to think that I'm a little God, control of my life. Every time I kind of rob God of his sovereign crown and I make myself that little sovereign God, but I crumble before circumstances and trials that are bigger than I am. And it's wearing me out. If you would say, I don't want to fight against God anymore. He can crush me any moment. You're thirsty to be forgiven. Come and place your full trust in Jesus Christ and all your sins will be wiped out clean. God must punish every sinner. But by believing in Jesus as your substitute, it would mean that God made Jesus to drink your cup of suffering. Place your faith in Jesus, that he died and rose again, and that he bore the full wrath of God on your behalf, and that by his death, he canceled your debt. That's what water means. Water means that if you're thirsty, you come to Jesus, and that he would forgive you, and he would accept you and give you life. How good is that? But it's not just waters. It's also milk. There is more in this bargain. There is milk. What does milk speak of? It speaks of nourishment, growth. Milk speaks of strength and vitality. God is not just offering you life and then he left you morally depraved, spiritually weak like a a 99-year-old grandma who is on spiritual crutches. No, he's offering you to be strong, to be stable, to stand firm in your walk with him. Are you thirsty for strength? Do you feel like you're in a never-ending cycle of sin? Do you feel like you're in bondage, chained? Do you hot temper and lust for possession and power? are like cruel masters. The urge to feed the lust of the flesh feels like a strong beast that you just simply cannot overpower. Do you feel so weak that you don't have spiritual biceps or stamina to go on in your holy walk? The scripture here says, Come, buy milk without money and without cost. Now, what is that milk? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 tells us, it says, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. And what is that milk that Peter is talking about? He tells us, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Christ is our milk. It is Christ that gives us strength. This is why Paul says in Philippians, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Christ gives us strength. Now in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prayed that he wanted us to have our eyes of our hearts to be open, to understand the extent of that power, that strength that is available to you and I who believe. In verse 19, and he would say in chapter 1, the surpassing greatness of his power, surpassing greatness toward us who believe. Well, how much? What is that surpassing greatness of his power, Paul? How much strength available to you and to me, to those who believe? He continues on and he tells you. 
These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Meaning that the strength God offers you is proportional to the same strength that God has given Jesus when He died and He rose Him up from the dead right through all to the highest of heaven and seated Him at the right hand of the Father. And to that same degree, God's strength is available to you. <laughs> this is not just a, some diluted powder milk that you add water to it. <laughs> this is potent. This is full cream condensed milk, concentrated infinite strength available to those who come. If you're thirsty for milk, for strength, come to Jesus Christ to find the milk that you need in order to fight against sin and the lust of your flesh. How awesome. Jesus did not just come to die for your sins and then gone to heaven and left you in the clutches of your sins. No, it says if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Jesus died and rose again to make the power of God accessible to you. If you believe, if you come to Jesus, He will break the chains of your sins and shatter the walls of your heart and will come to live within you so that by His strength you could overcome the sin that is in your life. And therefore, to be able to live a holy life. Some unbelievers, when I ask them, why don't you come to Christ? They say, well, we would love to come to Christ, but I fear that when I come to Him, I'm going to go back into the same way and live the same way that I used to live before I came to Him. This is a lie from the pit of hell. Christ is not just our water. He is our milk. He is our strength. He says in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But by him and through him, we can conquer mountains of sins. Water and milk. The last one is wine. What does wine speak of? It speaks of pleasure. People drink water in order to live. But when they want to experience some pleasure and delight, they drink wine. And coming to Jesus is the most joyful experience anyone can have. Unbelievers, they think that by coming to Jesus, they would live a sad life. I heard once before an unbeliever, um, he said to his wife, if you ever think that I will ever come to Jesus and be miserable for the rest of my life, you're out of your mind. Do you know who the most boring person is in the world? It's he who has to try to look around in the things of this world to have quick fix, sinful relationship, entertainment, alcohol, work. And when all these things go, they leave you drinking the misery of your sin, but the real wine is Jesus Christ. You come to him, and Jesus would put thunder in your heart, gladness in your soul. You know what the Bible says about sin? The Bible says about sin that it's, 
Its pleasure is a fleeting pleasure, the fleeting pleasure of sin. You know what that means? It means that the pleasure of sin would just simply fade away. But another passage, it speaks of sin as the deceitfulness of sin. Meaning sin promises satisfaction, but it never delivers. Never. And not only does it ever, never, ever deliver satisfaction, but once you're committed to it, it leaves you worse than when you first committed to it. Not so with our sweet wine, Jesus Christ. It says in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. You will forever be satisfied. The worst thing that God would ever do to you is to give you life and to give you strength to overcome sin and then leaves you drowning in your misery and boredom for eternity. Aren't you glad that this is not the case with our gracious God? Psalm 16 verse 11, believe the word of God. Believe the word. The word says, in your presence there is lots of joy. Is that what it says? Mostly joy. What does it say? Fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Not only there will be fullness of joy, but what that also means is that outside of that realm, anything else is but joy. It's a lie from the devil. When God wanted to give us a picture of heaven, an image, illustration, how was it depicted in, on the papers of the Scripture? A non-ending wedding feast where there was dancing and singing and eating and laughter. And the crown of all that celebration is the joy of knowing our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. He is our sweet, delicious wine. And God gives this wine away freely, knowing Jesus Christ. Why is it freely? Because Jesus paid the price for it. How good, how amazing is this news? Now let's wrap it up. You, you may have come here and you don't really care about Jesus Christ. And your intention is just to come and sit and fill on a seat or this is what you do on Sunday morning. But you're really not bothered at all about what the Word says. You had your heart set on what this world offers to you. And I'm telling you, it's a lie. But if you come to Christ dead in sin, well, He came to give you life. This is water. You come to him weak and there is no strength, unable to fight against your own anger, your own lustful desires. Well, he died in order to give you strength. This is milk. And you will come to him bearing the consequences of your own sin in misery, depression. He rose again in order to give you joy. His joy, that is wine. Knowing Jesus Christ is indeed our joy. He is our faithful friend, loving husband, good shepherd, caring brother. Jesus is our sacrificial savior and he is at the same time our mighty God. And as we get to know him and as who he really is, our hearts would enlarge and we would burst with joy. The sweetness, the sweetness of Jesus Christ is indescribable. His healing, His power, His supremacy and satisfaction. If we would fly over the highest mountain or dive into the deepest ocean, 
nothing will you ever find that would satisfy our hearts but Christ alone who created our hearts. If you bring all the pleasures of this world, good car, promotion at work, clean and tidy home, stable income, holiday house at a beach somewhere, lots of gimmicks and entertainments. And even if you bring all the pleasures that seem to be holy and godly, learning the Bible, going to church, being a really, really good Bible teacher, if you bring all these pleasures and you put them side by side with the pleasure of knowing Jesus Christ, who is our wine, it would be like getting a candlestick and you're placing it before the light, the brightness of a midday sun. It's just going to melt it away. What is the grace of God? The seller is the infinitely good God. And he lavishes upon the buyers who are the worst sinners with the greatest gift ever known to man. Jesus Christ. He is our life. He is our strength and He is our joy. And how much? Without money and without cost. Don't you want to love this God of grace? Don't you want to adore Him? Believers, my brothers, I want to tell you that the more you meditate upon this grace of God, this grace of God will be like a bomb. And you cannot simply wrap your arms around it before it actually explodes in your face. You cannot contain the grace of God within your bosoms. You've got to go out and share this grace of God with other people. Let us be an extension to this salesman. Let us work in his business of reaching out to the lost and share with them the grace that you're now enjoying. God forbid that we would hide this talent and that would be that selfish and that greedy and bury it under the sand. No. Brothers and sisters, let us go into the highways and the byways and even to the darkest corners of our community and share with them and call upon those sinners to come, to come to Christ. <clears throat> well, for unbelievers among us, just stay with me for a moment. There is another verse in the same passage. If you just read it in verse 6. And it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. This is a limited time only kind of sale. People are buying this product left, right and center. And you don't want to miss out. This is your opportunity of your lifetime. And you cannot afford to linger. Should I commit? Should I not commit? You've got to be decisive. You've got to commit to receive this priceless product. Read it with me again. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. This salesman is not hanging out here for long. Before you know it, this salesman is going to pack up his goods. He's going to pull his cart away from you. And he's going to move to another marketplace where there will be more people that are more keen than you to buying his goods. You've got to come to Christ and you've got to come to Christ at once. Throw yourself at his feet. Is the water of life, meaning that you've got to beg Him to forgive your sins. 
He's a divine milk. Meaning you've got to beg him to give you his strength in order to fight against your sins. And he is our sweet, delicious wine. You've got to beg him to grant you to be satisfied in him so that he alone and no one else but him, he is our jealous God, right? He does not want to share his, your heart with anybody else. Him alone to be the source of your pleasure. Amen? This is the best Christmas present that you would ever have. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we are. Uh, are here once again. <clears throat> we are humbled by the text before us this morning. We are the beggars. We have nothing to offer you but sin and shame and guilt. And you are God. You don't need us. We are the ones who are meant to be pleading with you and begging you. But what we see in this text is a generous, good God who doesn't need us. And yet, you're the one who is pleading with us, trying to convince us to put some sanity in our minds to come to you. How stubborn are we, Lord, that even when God himself, the God of all creation, pleads with us to come to him, yet we linger. And even for those believers, Lord, that are among us who have tasted you and enjoyed you, we go back into this dump and misery, Lord, by preoccupying our hearts and mind and time with worthless things. Oh, how we need you, Lord, to remind us, Lord, of the beauty of Christ, how he is our life, how he is indeed our strength and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.